Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Introduction to Construction Management. Today we're going to be continuing on where we left off in Lecture 3A. So we're going to be reviewing uh, contracting methods or procurement methods and we're going to be looking at a number of different uh, procurement methods including lump sum contracts, unit price contracts, uh, cost plus contracts, design build contracts, and construction management. And each one of these actually forms sort of a different working relationship between the owners or clients and the parties involved, the contractors and consultants. It, it's based on a number of areas, including the assignment of risk, complexity of the projects, how they're being funded. There's a lot of elements that come into play when deciding the contract type or the best contract type under a specific situation. So um, really, as I mentioned, we're trying with contracts to look at um, how we can price the individual projects. And with pricing, there's always a certain amount of risk. And sometimes, you know, if you take a really complex project and you want to lump some bid on it, you may find that the contractors uh, have to pad that pri price because of the risk that they're taking. They may feel this is too difficult or risky for us to tighten up our pricing and our budget on this. So what they have to do is they have to bring in probabilities, risk probabilities, do a risk log of all of the potential risks. And you know what's what's the potential probability of this happening and if it does happen what's the cost of it happening and then they have to factor that into their pricing models uh, so if it's a lump sum that might mean that the owner potentially is paying a large amount of money uh, contingent on some of these things happen what if they never happen well the contractor is going to do very very well uh, so some owners will want to not in the sense have the contractor take on that risk but pay a much higher price for it, they might want to have some form of sharing of the risk or changing the contract around and that may potentially lower their price. There's a lot of mays and ifs in this aspect but really it is looking at the assignment of risk and responsibility. It also looks at the timing, how quick we can get the project started. That also plays into the factoring as well. So it's really important to understand the risk um, associated with the different types of construction contracts. And choosing a, a, an appropriate uh, contract type is really essential to successful performance. And sometimes it depends if it's a government agency, there's a lot more uh, pressure on government agencies uh, to use lump sum type pricing because you're, you know, you're representing the taxpayer's money and you like to have that everybody competitively bid on this and uh, the process is, is pretty transparent and who was the lowest price uh, gets the job. If they were pre-qualified for the work, everybody gets pre-qualified. But uh, that's not always the case, as you'll see. So there's the, the main sort of areas that we can think about lump sum, cost plus, and unit price contracts. And again, we'll look at some variations as well. Um, so lump sum contracts, we've kind of already talked a little bit about that, but can go by the name fixed price uh, contract or stipulated price contract. It's the amount of the whole project and it's put into a price right from the get go. So you better have really well developed drawings and specifications because that's what this price is based on. If when you get into the project, there's a lot of changes, uh, then what was the point of going with a lump sum contract? If there's, in some cases I've seen where there's as many changes and the value of the changes is 50 to 100% of the contract price. So do you really have a lump sum in that case? I'm going to say not really uh, because the changes are going to have individual costs and those are going to be priced out. They may be priced out based on criteria that's put in the lump sum contract. Uh, but nevertheless, it's not the same as having a lump sum with a few changes. You're always going to have a few changes in it. So that's something that should be a determinant whether you go with a lump sum or some other form of contract. And as I mentioned earlier, governments too, they want to uh, protect the taxpayer. And it's pretty good if they have clear drawing specifications and here's what it is. And if we can keep a tight lid on the changes, uh, then it looks and appears and most likely is 
uh, that um, due diligence has been taken in the case of this building project. Cost plus fee contracts. Uh, so cost plus, sometimes you'll hear the term time and material, and it's kind of a form of that. Uh, so really you have um, cost plus a fee. So you, that means that your costs, which would be like how many hours of labor that you did, uh, the material costs, and then a fee for you managing that process and your, your overhead and profit uh, generally as a percentage of whatever the direct costs are on the project is added to it. So cost plus, there's less risk for a contractor with a cost plus type contract. And for the owner, it means they can audit the work of the contractor. The contractor has to be able to substantiate all the costs. So it can be closely monitored. There's more monitoring goes on. If I'm the contractor too, I gotta be careful that I have everything well documented, my hours, everything well logged that I can justify that. Uh, because I, I always felt when I was doing cost plus type contracts, and I did quite a few of them, I always felt a certain amount of pressure to produce. Uh, you know, clients would be kind of more suspect if things seem to be taking longer. Why are you, you know, why are you taking so long? Where, whereas uh, in a lump sum, as long as you're going to meet the milestones, they don't care if you've got 20 people taking three days to do something, even if it seems like a lot of people, that doesn't bother them. They just care that you meet their key dates. Uh, in cost plus, it can bother them because they think maybe these people aren't being as productive as they could be. And you're, you know, expanding the overall value that you can add your percentage, which will be a bigger percentage if it costs more. So they worry that your extrinsic rewards, your incentives are there more to make this more expensive than less expensive. But at the same time, if you're a if you're a reputable contractor, you realize that you don't want that to happen and you want to retain this client. You don't want to have a bad relationship with this client. I always felt pressure that way. And so if we performed well, then it seemed like six months later, the client had another project for us. A year later, the client had another project for us. So I definitely don't want to disrupt that even flow of work that I constantly get from these clients. I want to be their preferred contractor. So cost plus arrangements work really well in those cases. They work really well when there's a lot of complexity and it's not this project scope is not that clear um, or the design is not complete. We want to get this project done. We've got the we've got the, the go ahead for the foundation uh, permit, the substructure permit so we can start excavating. We want you to do this on a cost plus basis. You can do that while the designs are being finished. And then at a later point, it can Actually, if the client wants, it can fold into a related type contract, which is what we call a GMP, a guaranteed maximum price contract. We'll talk about that later in the course, some of these variations, but guaranteed maximum price put simply at a certain point when everything has become more clear, there's not as much complexity anymore and you can clearly procure the work that's remaining, you can roll it into a guaranteed maximum price, which would mean that you have a guaranteed maximum price that it won't go over that and you generally split the profit that's, if you're able to do it for less than that, you split the profit between you and the client. Um, so it's another avenue that would provide some incentives for the contractor uh, to do the work. So that, that's fairly frequently uh, occurs. So you got your labor, your materials, your equipment, and then you got the contractor's fee, whatever that number is, if it's 10%, 15%, whatever that may be. Um, so uh, that's just giving you sort of a, a breakdown example. Don't take the numbers literally, but that's just the way it, it works in concept. Unit price contracts. This works very good where it's something you can measure very clearly. You know, how much drywall is going on per square foot. You could have a per square foot price based on how many, how many square foot you're going to put on and how, how much taping you're going to do. And if it's not clear what the quantity is, it can be adjusted. So very often you might have uh, even components in a lump sum contract may have stipulations or contingencies in place that if uh, you're ripping off the roof of this giant building and the subsurface needs to be replaced, it's so much per square foot to replace it. Right now you don't know how much it is, how many square feet you have, but once you rip it off, you've established a base price per square foot or per square meter. Um, so unit price contracts can work on anything that's really um, will be major elements of the project that's measurable. 
earthwork, moving earthwork can be by the cubic meter. Uh, when a masonry contractor completes a 100 meter square brickwork, uh, they will be paid for a 100 meter square of completed work at an agreed upon unit cost rate. That could be another example of that. Very frequently it's done with uh, subtrades because a lot of times theirs is a very measurable quantity and can be established that way. Usually when they price their own work, they, they do it by a measurable uh, mechanism. So, you know, site clearing, that would be, as I was saying, uh, could be measurable excavating, grading. Uh, so this could be by area. This could be by cubic volume. Um, Sub-base construction, maybe by square meter. Uh, finishing, so etc. There's a whole bunch of different areas that that can be based on the actual quantities. And then you'd have a price uh, per unit, right? How much was done? This times this will give you the total cost, right? So you know what the total quantity is, you know what the price per unit is, and then that will give you the total cost. So unit price contracts. And in heavy civil work and that sort of construction, that's very, very common. Uh, heavy civil could be roads, uh, power gen um, hydro generation, power dams, that sort of thing. So uh, methods of contracting or contractor selection, uh, usually you have uh, competitive bidding, definitely by far the most popular, uh, and negotiated contracting, especially in the private sector. Negotiated contracting becomes um, quite, uh, quite common. You know, you have, a, you have a client, they know you know what you're doing with their particular thing. Just take any box store or... Tim Horton's restaurants or, um, you know, uh, it could be anything that um, tends to repeat itself or you've got clients that do work over and over again. Very often they'll do the negotiated contract where you come up with a costing and then, you know, they might have some things they want to have clarified and you have, have an agreement. Very often in the private sector, it's uh, about time. You know, they want to know that you're going to be able to do this in this shorter period of time. And very often, even if it costs them a little bit more, they don't mind because you being sure, being pretty sure or confident in you that you can do it in this time means a lot to them. Because if it takes an extra six months for you to do it, that's six months of lost revenue by that factory or that store, right? So they think in terms of uh, the profit they would have lost there is probably exceeds the little bit extra they might pay you. And you'd be their preferred contractor because they have confidence because of your past success. And that's what I was mentioning before in one of the previous lectures with Pareto's Law 2080. 20% of your clients make 80% of your profits. And also 80% of your clients are repeat business. And you want to retain those 80%. You don't want to lose those clients. You want to be trying to get the, as much of that as you can. This is, really, this is really kind of the gold part of contracting. When you have those kind of clients in place and it's a good steady business. Competitive bidding is a tough business. And in the public sector, it's an even a tougher business because they're big pro they can be mid-sized to big projects and it's a very, you know, it's the lowest price. Here's the drawings, here's the specifications, it's the lowest price. And they have people committed with what they call a bid bond, a, basically a surety that means that if your price is off, you still have to do this work or give up that bid bond, which is a substantial amount of money. We'll talk about that in another lecture. So competitive bidding is uh, really a tough game. It's a tough game. And, uh, but uh, most big contractors, they do it. But they also do the other ones too. And they have a good income flow on that. So competitive bidding, uh, bids are solicited. If it's a public bid, it'll be in by a specific time and date. Even if it's a private bid, they'll have a date and a time. You must have your bid in by this amount. And the bid better, better have... Um, represented everything that it asked for in the bid documents. You know, WSIB, proof of uh, clearance certificates and payments, um, bid bond, it better be properly done, proof of insurance, all of these elements, whatever it's asking for, you better have provided it exactly. If anything's out of, is not clear or not done properly, the bid gets thrown out or doesn't get counted. So to do that well, um, you better have really good plans and specifications and they better be well thought out. Otherwise, you're going to be running into problems later on, as we kind of alluded to in uh, lecture 3A. Negotiated, as I was mentioning, uh, instead of soliciting 
uh, the owners often choose to work uh, with one or more selected contractors uh, through negotiation. And that's usually the owner working with their consultants. And if I say consultants, I just mean the architects or the engineering firm. You tend to get deal more with engineering firms when you get into like heavy civil projects and that sort of thing, and architects more with buildings. Uh, selects a contractor first, and then the total price and method of payment are um, negotiated. Uh, usually, there it'll it, those types of contracts are going to lend themselves more towards some sort of cost plus. Uh, design build kind of uh, methodology and as I said it's not that common in the public sector but it's definitely um, a common area in the private sector but again the private sector still would be mostly lump sum but it's definitely a pretty good chunk of it especially with clients that do a lot of construction work they feel comfortable with this kind of method so procurement, it, that's purchasing, right? It's the process of purchasing goods and services. So if you're having trouble with procurement, just think of it, you're, you're buying somebody's um, services or product. And um, the procurements, you, once you're awarded the contract, you're gonna start procuring um, all the subcontractors. That's that process of making contracts with them. And so it's, it's, it's what we have to do in order to be able to deliver the project scope and complete the contract. And it's, it's the framework of contracts between owners and GCs and GCs and subcontractors, and even between owners and subcontractors, if it's like a CM construction management contract uh, where, the, where the construction manager is not at risk. So uh, really it, it, it the procurement route considers the type of contract, the owner's objectives, uh, the risks that are being assigned, uh, how fast do we need to get this construction started? That's a big deal today. That's why lump sum has lost a little bit of its luster over the last um, 15 or 20 years is because people want, private clients want things done sooner. Maybe not as much government, but cl private clients want it sooner. And so they may not have a complete set of drawings and specifications. So that kind of pushes them more to a different procurement route in some cases. Uh, and some of the, the individual qual complexities of the project, uh, as I mentioned here, can also be um, part, part and parcel with uh, ownership of the property, the complexity of the ownership, the financing. Uh, there may be different uh, financing uh, constraints on the owner, depending on how much of this project is going to be financed, that can also um, determine the procurement route. So for example, even in very, very large projects and it's being heavily financed, uh, you might want to separate up the project so that it's not all going to one contractor in case, what if that contractor goes bankrupt? Now the whole thing is going to go to a pot like a house of cards. Governments often do those kind of uh, splitting up uh, the prime contract uh, with two or three different contractors and they break the work up into phases. So it's not all uh, one contractor. And also they have to represent the taxpayers and they also don't want to give it all to one contractor. I've seen that with LRTs like the Ottawa LRT where they didn't want the same contractor to do the next phase only for the sake of they didn't want to have that one contractor or consortium. It's a P3 private public partnership getting awarded that multi-billion dollar project the next phase, even though they probably knew it the best and understood it, uh, just uh, to make sure that there's a sharing of taxpayer money amongst Canadian companies and employers, etc. Or in some cases, a consortium that may not all be Canadian. Uh, politics gets into it, right? <laughs> Uh, so we have three procurement methods, uh, as I was uh, saying. So design, bid, build, that's your typical kind of lump sum, uh, unit cost kind of ones that we were just talking about earlier. Design, build, uh, and construction management. So des design, bid, build, I usually just think, okay, it's a lump sum. And so there's gonna, it's going to be designed by the architectural company. It's going to be bid on by the GCs and then it's gonna be built, right, by the GCs, and it's gonna be monitored usually with the consultant acting in the client's interests. Very traditional method of project delivery. 
this sort of format again that we're talking about. And again, we did uh, in part A, the different contract relationships of how they go through. So uh, you can go to 3A again and see that if you've forgotten that. Design build, gotten, it has gotten a lot more popular. Now there's a lot of advantages too because you're designing it and you're building it. So you might have a contractor that they design it in-house or very often they will partner with an architectural firm. So, you know, you might have a big general contractor uh, like uh, Ellis Don and they might partner with a Stantec as the consultants. And so they're gonna do the design, Ellis Don's gonna do the build. And if it's done right, they collaborate during the design process to come up with something that is gonna be very much value engineered uh, for the project because they can do that. You know, the other method I said, the traditional, the architectural consulting firm does the design. Then it meets the client's requirement. Then it's put out to bid. The contractor bids on what they design. They don't consult about the design. They don't change the design. They just say what this is to build. Well, I think in my mind, a method that involves collaboration with the designers and the person that's gonna build it is going to get you an a better end product because builders know how to build. I don't care about architects. You know, they don't know how to build the way builders know how to build. You know, whatever your, your thoughts are on that. Builders don't know how to design. Architects know how to design. So when you get a combination of those strengths and you collaborate and you pull that in, in my mind, you get a, a, a more positive uh, result. Uh, and you have less adversarial relationships uh, going on in the process. So there can be those benefits. The other thing with a design build, you're working collaboratively. If it's a fat, what they call a fast track project, you're, the design is being worked on. The, the approvals have been done with the city. They, the final building permit hasn't been approved, but everything else is approved in concept and the excavation and substructure permits have been granted. And so then you can actually start the work. And while you're doing that work, the architectural team is finishing up all of the, you know, the mechanical system finishes, all the uh, interior finishes, exterior cladding finishes, so that you've already been working and the design is being complete. The other way, you gotta wait till the design is completely done. And then you have to bid on it. This way, you're already in the ground and the design is being continued and finalized. And by the time you need the full building permit, you're coming out of the ground at that point. So uh, that can save literally months of time. So there can be some advantages to that. Sometimes it can be problematic if the sub base uh, design wasn't done that well and then that requires rework or changes because something wasn't thought, thought through enough then that can be expensive. So that's the downside. Everything has pluses and um, minuses. Uh, good examples of design build, uh, the uh, waterfront uh, campus. It wasn't exactly design build, it was more what they called design assist, uh, but uh, the contractor was heavily involved in the design uh, process and they uh, were able to start excavating very, very quickly on that because the government wanted people to go be put to work because of the financial crisis of 2008. That was a massive sort of government spending program on infrastructure. And you could imagine the same thing goes in the private sector. So uh, design build method, owner design contractor, uh, suppliers, uh, so sort of design uh, build sort of process. This is, they're collaborating. Again, within them, they may have, it may be a, a, a two firms, like a Stantec, an Ellis Don, um, could be like two firms that are partnered on this too. It doesn't have to be that it's the one contractor. They, they may even form a separate entity just for this project, um, just so that they can manage it effectively. So CM, uh, You'll hear CM used a lot, and CM means construction management methodology or construction management contract. Uh, the owner hires a construction manager to provide pre-construction advisory services and then to undertake actual construction. Uh, construction management companies, they have expertise. They know how to manage construction projects. They have all the contacts with the subcontractors. They have the relationships with the contractors and the suppliers. 
they probably are a general contractor that do other types of projects and then they do this. Some companies, they don't do other models. They only do construction management. Uh, means they don't self-perform anything. They just manage projects. So some companies like to just hone in on focus in on that. Other companies, they'll do the gambit of different contracts to suit whatever the client wants at that point. Usually the bigger the company, the more likelihood that is. And uh, so it's a procurement route in which the works are constructed by a number of different trades. And um, the trade contractors under what we call CM at, uh, CM not at risk, uh, the uh, subcontractors are contracted directly with the client but managed by the CM. Uh, so the, man, the CM man, manager is acting as an agent for the client, administering and coordinating the work of the contracts and advising who to pick. Sometimes it gets to be a struggle because the client wants to go with the lowest price subcontractor and the CM is saying, they're gonna be a problem. This one's not quite capable. We've had them before and the client's like, well, that's why I'm paying you to manage them. Uh, and sometimes that doesn't work too well in some cases. But uh, generally, if you have a, a good relationship between the CM and the client, um, that can work pretty well. Then we have CM for uh, services. The owner hires the construction manager, acts as an agent to provide advisory service, ministry, and oversight of the contracts. The owner hires trade contractors directly to perform the work, as I mentioned. And the owner hires the construction manager to provide the advisory service to engage the trade contractors as uh, subcontractors, all right? So again, it's um, uh, similar that way. Um, so one, one is um, for just the services, acts as the agent to provide advisory services, and the other is for services and construction. So this is actually to um, oversee the construction, and engage with them. So um, this is where you have this, there you don't have, um, if it's just at services, the owner's in between here and they're contracting with uh, the trade contractors directly. The CM's off to the side and the design consultants are off to the side. Uh, when we look at this, uh, you have CM for services construction. Now this can be done at risk where the contracts are with the construction manager or where the construction manager is just only managing these trades and the contract is with the owner. So it can be done in different ways. There's some complexity and hybrids in the process of CM. So you really have to ask what you're doing or thinking about there. A lot of contractors do like this CM for services and construction, not at risk, meaning that uh, for services, but also for construction, but they're not contracting directly with the trade contractors. So in summary, uh, there are a number of different contract types and there's ones and hybrids that we didn't talk very much about. P3, very popular private public partnerships. Uh, usually a consortium is fo formed between designers, uh, uh, contractors, and um, maybe another specialty. It depends what it is. Good example, Eglinton Crosstown. So you have like a prime contractor who has excellent construction management services. You have an engineering company because it's very complex, all of the tunneling issues. And then you have a tunneling company uh, that is handling the tunneling and uh, substructure uh, boring work and excavation work. So you look at that. And then of course you have a multitude of subcontractors that they would have to hire in the process, but together they form a consortium and uh, handle that uh, work. I think it's SNC Lavalin for the design, Elliston for the actual work, and Dragatas for Dragatas, a large uh, tunneling company out of Spain for, for that part of it. So that's a P3. Another process is integrated project delivery, better known as IPD. This is the one that is getting a lot of discussion uh, because you form a consortium and it's the prime contractors that are involved in the project. So you'd be looking at, you'd probably be looking at uh, a company that would be uh, big enough that they would handle usually the electrical and mechanical systems. So 
you could think of maybe a state uh, electric. I think even Guild now does uh, state Ni modern Niagara Guild. Some of these large, large companies that have procured uh, other areas. They maybe started as an electrical sub, but then they bought the mechanical side as well because now they're able to more easily provide one-stop shopping, say, for the business services. Uh, and not the building services, what I meant to say. Uh, because building services, uh, your HVAC and your building systems, they, you know, depending on the building type, they are 40 to 50% of the overall building cost. So that's a huge amount of money in that process. And um, so an IPD, you involve them, you involve the designers, you involve the GC, you involve the owner too. The owner is involved in this. And you work collaboratively on the design to come up with the best possible model and design that can be built and provide value to the end user. So it's really looking at, well, what is the end game with this project? The end game with this project is to provide value for the client. And if we do this right, everybody that's providing value for the client can make a profitable business through, through this process. So IPD, Integrated Project Delivery, is really um, a system, contract system, that is very holistic, that the key main members get to share in the profit instead of it just being one, uh, and then one doing this, and then this adversarial relationship. It's actually a collaborative, a sharing of the profit. If one makes a mistake, everybody's sharing in that mistake. So there's a lot of incentive for nobody to make mistakes. And if there's a mistake to get out of them very inexpensively. I wish I could say that that was the model that was being used everywhere because I think it's got a lot of potential. But for that to really fly, owners have to buy into it. And it's been a bit of a slow process to get owners to buy into it. Some progressive companies, a lot of our students have been hired over the years. A very up and coming company is Gillum Group. And they kind of really sort of I would say are kind of leaders in this particular area. And um, Marcus Gillum is uh, really, I've seen him present a few times and I've been to their office quite a few times. They've hired a lot of our students. Uh, they're very progressive on the lean construction methodology, which we'll talk about as well in this course. Uh, and lean is all about reducing or eliminating waste. You know, reducing is probably a more uh, realistic target. Uh, continuous improvement. Uh, reducing waste and that's going to add value so reducing waste and providing value to the client anything that's not value is waste we can just think of it that way so that's IPD that we didn't really get into but I wanted to bring it up uh, just to make sure that um, we got to that okay so that's just giving you a little bit of an overview and a summary of the different contract types and where the industry is kind of going there's a lot of discussion we'll bring the IPD up uh, later on in the course as well um, there's a lot of discussion about how we need to sort of change things in the construction industry a little bit. And that's one of the suggested uh, mechanisms that uh, where change is taking place as we kind of started out this course with change and how the world is changing and things are changing and how we have to sort of uh, jump on that bus and make sure that we're part of, the, part of the change revolution in construction. So I'm Tom Stevenson, signing off for today. And everybody have a wonderful day, and I'll see you in lecture four. Bye for now.